Salman. And what followed was a lifelong friendship. And that too was a, a love story. I want to read then to you from Midnight's Children, which was a book which completely bowled me over. One Kashmiri morning in the early spring of 1915, my grandfather, Adam Aziz, hit his nose against a frost-hardened tussock of earth while arranging to pray. Three drops of blood plopped out of his left nostril, hardened instantly in the brittle air, and lay before his eyes on the prayer mat, transformed into rubies. Lurching back until he knelt with his head once more upright, he found that the tears which had sprung to his eyes had solidified. And at that moment, as he brushed diamonds contemptuously from his lashes, he resolved never again to kiss earth for any god or man. Briefly, before comprehension, I, won I wondered if that was all there was to kissing, the languorous approach and then the sudden turkey jerk away. <laughs> the effect was usually somewhat comic, and censorship still retains in contemporary Pakistan a strong sense of comedy. When the Pakistani censors found that the movie El Cid ended with a dead, Christian, uh, with a dead Charlton Heston leading the Christians to victory over the Muslims, they nearly banned it until they had the idea that simply cutting out the entire climax so that the film, as screened, showed El Cid mortally wounded, El Cid dying nobly, and then ended. <laughs> Muslims won, Christians nil. My first direct experience with censorship took place in 1968 when I was 21, fresh out of Cambridge, and full of the radical fervor of that famous year. I returned to Karachi, where a small magazine commissioned me to write a piece about my impressions of returning home. I remember very little about the piece. Mercifully, memory is a censor too. Except that it was not at all political. It tended, I think, to linger melodramatically on images of dying horses with flies settling on their eyeballs. You can imagine the sort of thing. Anyway, I submitted my piece, and a couple of weeks later was told by the magazine's editor that the press council, the national censors, had banned it completely. It's a style and its ferocious intelligence, but also because it was the first novel in which I had found a description of the birth of Bangladesh. So it, it's a book that's been close to my heart ever since. But I'm going to read from the beginning. Book one, The Perforated Sheet. I was born in the city of Bombay once upon a time. No, that won't do. There's no getting away from the date. I was born in Dr. Nalikar's nursing home on August 15th, 1947. And the time? The time matters too. Well then, at night. No, it's important to be more on the stroke of midnight, as a matter of fact. Clock hands joined palms and respectful greeting as I came. Oh, spell it out, spell it out. At the precise instant of India's arrival at independence, I tumbled forth into the world. There's a spectre always haunting the world. Sometimes it's further away, other times it's close, but it's always present, always a possibility, and always has to be fought. This spectre is a political and re religious idea called fascism. This contamination is, as we know, common in the world and becoming ever closer and more common, leaving the liberalism and democracy we like to take for granted in its wake. And fascism, like literature, is personal as well as political. It's inside the human being as well as outside as ideology. It can, as we know, become a state of mind, even of our own minds, of course. And what a mind it is that fascism creates it's an arid, one-dimensional place, a terror state stuck in the past where there cannot be any complexity or doubt, 
and which separates the internal population into us and them. When I called up Salman and said, could I interview him? And he said, I don't want to talk about what's happened. And I said, that's fine by me. What do you want to talk about? My new book, Sir Boyd Haroon and the Sea of Stories. It's a classic, an instant classic, but it was the most perfect rebuttal of what was going on. A work of art, an inviolable work of art. So I'll read a couple of pages from Haroon and the Sea of Stories. There was once in the country of Ali Bay, a sad city, the saddest of cities, a city so ruinously sad that it had forgotten its name. It stood by a mournful sea full of glumfish, which were so miserable to eat that they made people belch with melancholy, even though the skies were blue. In the north of the sad city stood mighty factories in which, I'm told, sadness was actually manufactured, packaged and sent all over the world, which never seemed to get enough of it. Black smoke poured out of the chimney of the sadness factories and hung over the city like bad news. I had a, I stole actually a copy of the satanic verses from friends of the family and I would carry it to school every day because just to be seen with that book meant everything. It meant that rebellion, rebellion was something that writers did. It meant that fearlessness was how I wanted to be seen. So the book was like a statement. And most of all, it meant to a young, nerdy, geeky girl that intellectualism was sexy. And if you wanted to, you could take on anybody with just the power of your words. So I'm reading from um, his collection of essays, The Languages of Truth. We were not Hindus, my family, but we believed the great stories of Hinduism to be available to us also. On the day of the annual Ganapati festival, when huge crowds carried effigies to the elephant-headed deity Ganesh to the water's edge at Chaupati beach to immerse the god in the sea, Ganesh felt as if he belonged to me too. He felt like a symbol of the collective joy and yes, unity of the city rather than a member of the pantheon of a rival faith. When I learned that Ganesh's love of literature was so great that he sat at the feet of India's Homer, the sage Vyasa, and became a scribe who wrote down the great Mahabharata epic, he belonged to me even more deeply. And when I grew up and wrote a novel about a boy called Salim with an unusually big nose, it seemed natural. Even though Salim came from a Muslim family to associate the narrator of Midnight's Children with the most literary of gods who just happened to have a big trunk of a nose as well. <laughs>